My creed as a Canadian is summed up in these words. I am a Canadian, a free Canadian, free to speak without fear, free to worship God in my own way, free to stand for what I think right, free to oppose what I believe wrong, free to choose those who shall govern my country. This heritage of freedom I pledge to uphold for myself and all mankind, for I am a Canadian. On December the 17th, 1941, a badly damaged Spitfire aircraft of the Royal Canadian Air Force staggered to a landing on an airfield outside London, its pilot dead. That pilot was John Gillespie McGee, a boy of 19 years of age, a man for all generations. In his tunic was a sonnet he had written on the back of a letter to his mother, words that live today and always will. I would like to read those words to you now. slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up, the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the heights with easy grace, where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent, lifting mind I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God. There must be a realization by all of us that we're Canadians, that we disagree. If we all thought alike, nobody would be thinking. The man who sits opposite is just as conscientiously in favor of his country and the betterment of that country than the one who sits with you as a colleague. I'll give you an example. It has to do with British politics. In 1961, the Right Honorable Harold Macmillan, the Prime Minister, had my wife and me to dinner. She sat to his right, and on the other side of her was the indomitable and the incomparable Sir Winston Churchill. I was on the other side of the table, far down. I was introduced to a Mrs. Chamberlain. I said to her, seeing Sir Winston in the happiest of good humor, engaged in the warmest of conversations with my wife and Mr. McMillan, I said, it's wonderful to see the old man so happy. Yes, she said. It's wonderful that he's here, too. For you and I would not be here but for him. The speaker 
was Mrs. Neville Chamberlain, who died very recently and was speaking of the man who had driven her husband out of public life. That's my idea of parliamentary government. The first time I met Winston Churchill was in 1941 in December. I had seen him in the gallery, from the gallery of the House of Commons in 1916 when he was in disgrace following Gallipoli. When he got up to speak with the mud of France on his uniform, the house emptied. I saw him in 1932 when he was a pariah. I saw him in 1936 when he became the king's man at the time of the abdication. I saw him in 1939. I said to him, Prime Minister, the first time I saw you, you were in disgrace. His answer, which time was that? Uh, I happened to be a teetotaler, and the first occasion that my wife and I were at lunch at Churchill's was in 1957. All during the luncheon, he was reaching down. I wonder what he was reaching for. Finally, he came up with a bottle, which even to my unpracticed eye represented uh, one of the few remaining portions of Napoleonic brandy. It was about half full, the bottle. He said, will you have some? And I said, I never take any. And he put his earpiece on so that he could hear me more clearly. I said, I'm a teetotaler. And he said, you're a what? Are you a prohibitionist? And I said, no. I was a prohibitionist who beat you in, in Dundee in 1920. And he said, yes, I had very bad luck that year. I had two or three defeats in succession. He said, uh, so you're not like Scrimger, who was the successful candidate against him on that occasion? I said, no, I'm a teetotaler, but not a prohibitionist. He found difficulty in understanding that. His wife helped out. Finally, he got it clear. He said, what you say is this, that you are a teetotaler and not a prohibitionist. I said, that's right. Oh, in that case, you only hurt yourself. Churchill was terrible when the time. I was there the day that, in 51, when the conservative member left and went over to the labor side because they didn't expect the old man would win again, you see. Well, Churchill watched him. Finally, the member came to rest in the far back seat the church said, Mr. Speaker, this is the first time in recorded history that anyone has ever seen a rat swimming towards a sinking ship. First time I spoke with R.B. was in 1917. I had just come back from overseas and I was still in uniform. He was terrific. First time I heard Bennett speak was in 1904, the little schoolhouse at Fort Carlton, where my father taught. Uh, there were no more than 17 present, and Bennett spoke for two hours and a half. And when Bennett spoke, he, his delivery was, a, I think, an average of 175 words a minute. In those days, Richard B. Bennett was known as Richard Bonfire. Oh, he was terrific. I'm sitting over there, and R.B. says, I didn't send you a wedding present, did I? No, didn't know. I said I'd been married for years. They, um, well, he said, anyway, I can give you a picture. 
And he reaches in this drawer and he brought out a picture that size in his Windsor uniform. And he had a very large middle and rather spindly ankles. He inscribed the photograph, he handed it over to me. I didn't think that my face betrayed any emotion at all. He reached over and he grabbed it. He said, you do not like it. He took it out of my hands, put it back in the drawer, and I never had the picture from Mr. Bennett. However, I didn't go home for about a month. And when I got there, I was informed that there was something wrong with my trust account. And I was disturbed. I said, I've never touched my trust account. No, we're over. Somebody anonymously deposited to my account. That was the wedding present. And we had a member by the name of Billy Essling. He was about 75 to 8 years of age and blind, loved by everybody. He could recognize every member in the house who spoke by his voice. He loved all mankind but Dukabors. He had them in his constituency. And they, from time to time, used to go on nocturnal or even day walks clad in their native raiment. And uh, he said, it's getting very serious, Billy Estling said, that these women march about in this way to the discomfiture of our people. Sitting directly opposite, because he was sitting with the whip, there was a, a chuckle. It was the chuckle of the Prime Minister. And uh, Billy said, the Prime Minister laughs. I ask him a question. What would he do some morning if he were to arise at Kingsmere and see a half a dozen Duke of War women totally devoid of all raiment? <laughs> he said, I ask. And Mackenzie King, for the first and only time in his life, showed any sense of humor. He said, I would immediately call in the leader of the opposition. Bennett was indignant. He rose. He said, Mr. Speaker, the right honorable gentleman exaggerates. Dispensing patronage outside of his own party has never been characteristic of him. No man in public life was ever more human than Sir John. Known as old man tomorrow, he was the first Canadian to say, I am a Canadian. We remember him today as the man who put this great country together. A man who was able to bring together jarring elements and achieve agreement. How he was able to achieve this was in large measure due to his incredible ability to temper truth with humor and to use wit for the maintenance of a sense of proportion. A soft answer, it has been said, turneth away wrath. In MacDonald's case, a humorous one sometimes increased it, but in any event, reduced the argument to reasonable proportions. So what I'm going to do is to tell you some stories about Sir John, to show you how human old tomorrow was. I recall one incident that one of his cabinet ministers, Darcy McGee, difficulties had arisen. McGee began to drink. Sir John said to him, I have no objection to anything 
that my cabinet does under ordinary circumstances. But I want to point out that there is no room in my cabinet for two drunks. Everyone who's been Prime Minister of Canada has had the experience. Whenever a senator becomes ill or is reported in the press, immediately letters are received. You can be sure of them the next day. They generally read something like this. I'm deeply concerned over the fact that Senator A is ill. I do hope he'll recover. But if in God's grace he does not, I would be prepared to accept an appointment so that Canada may be able to continue, even in a larger field, to have the benefit of my service and experience. MacDonald used to attend all the funerals of members of Parliament or Senators. He liked funerals, providing he was fortified to enjoy them. He attended a funeral of a Senator, and one of these self-appointed, expectant and hopefuls got up close to him, and as the casket was lowered beneath the soil, the man said, Sir John, I'd like to take his place. Sir John said, I can't hear you. What did you say? He said, I'd like to take his place, Sir John. John replied, my friend, I think it's a little late now. It was not hard to like Sir John MacDonald. His humor had a way of smoothing over the roughest of circumstances. I think of the example of one of his friends. It appointed him to a position as keeper of the Rideau Canal locks, or one of the locks. This man had been addicted to liquor. He started on the job on Monday. He disappeared Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and later in the week. The question was raised in the house. He was criticized for having appointed this man. It was completely unjustified, the appointment. He said, you should have known better. Why? He hasn't been around. And in that particular lock, there's no water anymore. And Sir John said, heavens, has well started to drink canal water. And that's the way he brushed aside the criticism. Sir John could laugh at himself. And that's one of the major attributes that must be possessed by anyone in public life who occupies a position of leadership. The caricatures of him make me realize that I'm only in the second class. Ben Goff was the major cartoonist. He invariably pictured Sir John with a nose slightly less in size than the head. On one occasion, Sir John was in the barber shop and in came a liberal and he said, well, I think, Sir John, that you'll agree that the only person who can tweak your nose is your barber. And old Sir John said, and if he does, he has a handful. I recall a story of R.S. White, MP, during the days that Mr. Bennett was prime minister. White, in the late 1880s, had been a member of the press gallery. And one of the stories had to do with a delegation from the city of Montreal came to Ottawa to see Sir John. Uh, the chairman of the delegation was a leading temperance man in Montreal and invariably commenced every presentation with an explanation uh, that he was, in fact, a temperance worker and had no use for anyone who at any time took a drink. Mr. White was concerned over what the reaction would be as he led in the delegation. Sir John was apparently in no mood for, for play that day. He was very cold and aloof. The chairman started in by explaining that he was a temperance man. He was sitting alongside Sir John and Sir John looked at him. 
and said, Sir, your breath is disgusting. It smells of water. Uh, that broke the ice. Somebody said, they tell me that you are regarded as the damnedest liar in all Canada. To which you replied, I dare say, they have foundation for that. Somebody else said to, of him, he's a pocket edition of Judas Iscariot, neatly bound in calf. Why calf? At a convocation of McGill University, Lord Dufferin, uh, the governor general, made the address in Greek. In those days, the classics were regarded as a prerequisite uh, to identification as an intellectual, or indeed, necessary for everyone to have a fundamental knowledge of the classics. Sir John had none of that. He had a friend in the Montreal Gazette. And the event was written up and the speech was spoken of. The reporter stated, that Lord Dufferin had spoken in the most perfect Greek. What he said was the epitome of Greek. Sir Hector Langevin came along the next day in the cabinet and he said, Sir John, did you read what the reporter said regarding Lord Dufferin's speech to the convocation? Yes, that reporter's a friend of yours, isn't he? Yes. Does he know any Greek? No. Well, where did he get the information for the article? He said, I told him. But he said, Prime Minister, you don't know any Greek. No, said Sir John, but I know a little about politics. I think it was 1878. He went to Washington for the purpose of assuring the protection of Canada's rights in connection with fisheries. The British thought he was an interloper. It wasn't right that a Canadian should dare turn up to even be present when treaties were being made. Sir John went. He insisted on his right to be heard, even though he wasn't listened to. About the only place he was welcome uh, was when gatherings were convened to honor the visiting delegates. He was permitted to go along. And on this particular occasion, uh, the presidential yacht was taken down the Potomac. A senator's wife sat down beside him and said, where do you come from? He said, Canada, ma'am. She went on to say, they tell me you have a smart man up there by the name of MacDonald. He replied, yes, ma'am, he is smart. But everybody says around here that he's a perfect rascal. Yes, uh, that's his reputation, a perfect rascal. What I'd like to ask you is this. How do you Canadians elect such a scalawag? Well, he said, they can't get along without him. A few minutes later, her husband came along and introduced his wife to Sir John. She was very embarrassed and started to apologize Sir John said, don't apologize. Everybody in Canada believes everything that you said. There were few examples of bitter antagonism between Sir John and those who sat opposite him. But there was one exception. Uh, Richard Cartwright had been a conservative. He left... MacDonald, because he did not receive the portfolio that he hoped for. He became a liberal. His antipathy to MacDonald was revealed in every speech. In the 1880s, in front of the Parliament buildings, uh, there was a high board walk with railings on each side, some four feet in width. On one occasion, MacDonald and Cartwright met face to face on the boardwalk. Cartwright sneered as he came abreast of MacDonald. 
said, I never get out of the road of scoundrels. Sir John stepped one pace to the right and replied, I always do, Sir Richard. MacDonald's life has always been a source of interest and inspiration to me. It goes back a long way. My great-grandparents, the Bannermans, were crofters in Sutherlandshire, in Kildonan. About 14 miles away, the MacDonalds lived. In 1812, the Duchess of Sutherland decided that she would clear out the highlands in Sutherland. She drove them out in Kildonan. The crofters returned from a visit that was arranged on their behalf as a prelude to the destruction of their homesteads and found their homes burned down, their cattle gone, their sheep had disappeared. My great-grandfather and mother had no place to go but the new world. They were attracted by the promise that was given that in what is now the Winnipeg area would be a wonderful place to settle and start a new life. They joined the Selkirk Settlement and they arrived on the Red River in 1813. MacDonald's father and mother were driven out at the same time. They went to Glasgow where Sir John was born in 1815. If it had not been for the Scottish clearances, the first and the 13th Prime Minister of Canada would not have been. There are some people who believe that because from day to day in the House of Commons that we clash in debate, that thereby we become bitter enemies personally, nothing of the kind. Strong men have strong opinions. They express them strongly. That's always been so. Laurier and MacDonald clashed. Yet I think the finest tribute that was ever paid to anyone in Canadian public life was that of Wilfrid Laurier as he then was, two days after the passing of Sir John. It's a great piece spoken from the heart. These are a few of the quotations from Wilfrid Laurier's words. I think it can be asserted that for the supreme art of governing men, Sir John MacDonald was gifted as few men in any land or in any age were gifted. Gifted with the most high of all qualities, qualities which would have made him famous wherever exercised and which would have shone all the more conspicuously the larger the theater. It may be said without any exaggeration whatever that the life of Sir John MacDonald from the date he entered Parliament is the history of Canada. He was connected and associated with all the events, all the facts which brought Canada from the position Canada then occupied, the position of two small provinces having nothing in common but a common allegiance, united by a bond of paper and united by nothing else to the present state of development which Canada has reached.